So for me, I see, I don't see a thing called architecture. I just see the world around us, the culture and life we live, and that most of what's around us is designed, and so it's about how we design the right places. The most important part for me is not being great at drawing or designing and doing lovely curves and shapes or squares or whatever you're going to do, but the strategy is the part that we always think about a lot at the beginning because, and it's very unglamorous because you imagine that it's about, you know, oh, the imagination or all this. It's actually the imagination to imagine the brief in different ways and to imagine the conditions that exist within the place that you're going to work, within the thing you've been asked, and the context in our time and in history of the way people normally think about things. And so we've always tried to, I suppose I've always felt that it's, the brief is the most creative moment. And, so, and often, as the designer, you get the credit for something that's actually the brief. And so the key thing is working on the brief to start off with. And sometimes you get an incredibly good brief. And sometimes it's actually about using the team's skills and talents to reinvent the brief for the real issue. Then we thought, what should we do? Then we started drawing. But that was the key move that I think is why we um, won the award for the best um, foreign pavilion and it was it was strategy it wasn't sort of lying in a bath thinking like a kind of artist it was strategy and I actually think the best art is strategic I think the best anything is about the strategic way people think about it and now with the environment crisis that we're having now with this new uh, advent of a time where we are much more aware of international health issues, again, strategy is everything, and strategy is my passion, and strategy is where the true creativity actually is. And we miss it if we think the creativity is in waving your pencil or brush around. That follows, but it's the thinking, I believe, that matters for everyone. When I was training, I felt that the world was overrating the idea that the people leading creative teams were expressing themselves. And in a way that doesn't interest me and never did. And when I was little, I got interested in inventors. And it felt that inventions were the key to our future and to progress. And the, the things that society all got curious about whether that was in writing or food or painting or sculpture or science or maths they were inventive thoughts and invention isn't doesn't have a style invention is about having a problem or an issue that you're trying to solve and it felt that the world of designing buildings and the built environment and the thing called architecture had this funny approach that I didn't really get and I didn't believe in and that it needed a, a way that w I believed could be more respectful of a place which which is to see it as its own issue rather than an excuse to do more of what you always do and plonk it in this city or plonk it in that city so with the studio we've always been trying to grow something I guess, for me, the world of the design of the environments that surround us in the cities and even the nature and the world that everything now is thought of and either protected or amplified by design in one way or another. And the modern movement in architecture that happened a century ago was very dangerous in the way it got, I believe, too excited about the technology that existed at that time 
it was so ex it was so thrilled that it was possible to do air conditioning. It was so thrilled that you could make whole walls from glass. And it overreacted to those things. And we ended up with a sterile world because it thought it was being human. Because it thought walls are bad where you just don't get enough light through. So it swung to the opposite and said, well, if it was all glass, that would be great. But it then meant that you got overheating, distracted employees, nowhere to put things up, and an environment for people witnessing buildings of what felt like lazy architecture, because you could just go, the whole building's glass. There we go, it's all glass. And that was making things that felt very cold. And so, it thought it was being human. In this studio, we're trying to find what the true balance is between what you can do and what you actually should do. Because just because you can do all of these things doesn't mean that you should do them. And it isn't black and white. And even if you think you have the solution in one place, it doesn't mean you should apply it everywhere because then that becomes another formula. So the, the true balance of the need to have confidence, to be able to do larger scale, clear, confident moves, which the modern movement was excited about, but also how to have humanity and, um, and not over-exalt things that will make a clinical, unhumane experience for us all, that, push us apart from each other. And more than ever, we need to be together as, as a species. I think we're in a very interesting time when, particularly in China, there's so much development. It's, it's thrilling that the country has the confidence to build the homes for everybody to make the schools and universities and workspaces. And the scale that China thinks at is so gigantic and confident and comprehensive. And in China there's been, I felt, after the first wave, which felt like it was copying what happened in America or copying what happened in Europe, then it felt that China got really interesting in its own criticism and thought, well, why did we do that? Why? We don't need to copy America. We don't need to copy Europe. In fact, we have, we're leading environmentally. We're, pro we're producing more solar panels. We're doing all of these things. No more do we need to copy other people. In fact, we're a leader. Hmm, we're the leader. <laughs> what are we going to do? I remember when I was just starting to study the design of buildings and I went to a festival. In fact, maybe this is interesting about the, uh, this Biennale, the first ever Biennale. Um, I went to an architecture festival in Scotland. And at this festival, there were hundreds and hundreds of architecture students and many master architects speaking. And I had not studied studying uh, properly yet. And I was there, and I was looking, and I noticed that all the main speakers had never really built anything. This is very British, and they were, and they'd never built anything. So I was thinking, why are you famous if you have not built anything? But they'd published their drawings, and I thought, that's very strange. And then I spoke to the other students, and, it, and I'd just come from a summer of working, doing metal working. And uh, in my past before that, I'd done quite a lot of ceramic work and making bricks, actually. And so I asked the other students, you know, when you're on your summer break, do you work on a building site? Do you do woodworking? Do you do bricklaying? Have you ever mixed concrete? No one had ever made anything. And it felt, this is like the blind leading the blind. This really felt like this is not how things should be. In, and I think we're in a different time now. 
But the balancing of the emotional side, of the craft side, and the intellectual cerebral side, it's very hard to, to balance because they all matter. And it's easy to get obsessed with the grandiose um, political and s societal dimension and lose touch of the emotional, physical empathy that architecture has to have. And that, that Biennale that we had in the United Kingdom was maybe the most influential moment for me of realizing what the space was, what the opportunity was that was missing. And I think that these moments of these festivals can be a time when people come together and meet people and see things they wouldn't otherwise see and have moments of emotional breakthrough where they can find the fire that can be in their stomach 30 years later, like it is for me, uh, creating a, a design organization and finding amazing collaborators that, that have the chance to then do real work because of the fire in your stomach that can come from realizations at key moments. Beijing is very exciting for me amazing connecting point for us. Our studio grew at that point because the Chinese nation reached out and sort of offered us true friendship and it, it's been amazing since then. Um, I think that Beijing is, I, I, I find the old parts inspire me a lot. I never realized I liked grey before. I thought grey was just this colour that made the, the boring architecture in the UK and uh, but I never realised I could love grey and the, the, the bricks that the, the traditional courtyard houses were made from, the grey there wasn't the, isn't the grey that I was brought up around that was a depressing grey, it was a grey that makes the colour of human skin and the green of, of, of tree leaves and the brown of it all, for me, become more vivid and the colours in the food and so that was one sort of lesson that taught me something. The courtyard houses themselves taught me about heart, making a heart to a place and in many of the projects that we are now working on, we are trying to make a social heart that will bring people together and it just seems so beautiful to have a house with a heart, with doors you can open like that, that, that China was doing this hundreds of years ago. And so my, even when I built my own house in London, I had in my mind the courtyard houses. I could only get away with, I couldn't quite get all the way around because of the land ownership. But it, in my mind, I've, I was making a, a Chinese courtyard house. So I think about it every day. And, I, and when I'm in um, Beijing, I also see the buildings that are there and I see the new large developments. And I, I hope we can be more involved to try to make more human buildings and, and developments and make things that feel like they're particular to Beijing and not feel like they're from somewhere else. That's my passion. And, uh, I hope to learn more and more about Beijing in the next half of my life.